We like our rural living. If it means we have to drive a half hour to 45 minutes to a center to work, that's where we want to be. And we want to come home to the chickens in the backyard and the pigs up the street. We have our animals. My husband takes his chickens. We have dogs, you know. Uh, vegetable gardens. This is what people look forward to. I like to come. They like to enjoy our beaches, our open space, go hiking, ride horseback, whatever. But they. They come here looking for something else than they have where they live. Unfortunately, Wynwood, Oahu is zoned to uh, house um, over 300,000 people. We have 115,000 now. If something is going to give and something has to give, uh, it very likely will be agriculture. They are going to have to um, uh, accustom themselves to the idea that they cannot be the only fortunate, favored part of the island where there is to be nothing new happening. You can't just shut your eyes and say it must all go ever. No one would dispute the beauty of this windward Oahu countryside, but there are many who would say that some of this undeveloped land will have to give way to an expanding population. Those who value the rural life are afraid that another trans Ko'olau highway will cause the countryside to gradually fill up. In communities all along the coast, neighborhood boards and community associations are trying to solve the dilemma of preserving the quality of life while accommodating some inevitable growth and change. We're going to take a look at these windward communities to see how they're coping with some of the problems related to the development and the preservation of windward Oahu. Everything happening here now with parks, housing, transportation, water and land use, tourist development, has been affected by the few large landowners who own much of Windward Oahu's land. Beginning at Cavella Bay, Campbell Estate owns land extending down to Laie Point. Zion Securities, the financial arm of the Mormon Church, owns most of the Laie community, and Bishop Estate owns land between there and Kahana. Then comes Kualoa Ranch Company in Kaava. Until recently, Waikani and Waiaholi were owned by the McCandless Estate. Now the state of Hawaii is negotiating a purchase of Waiaholi Valley. Bishop Estate owns more land in Kaneohe and Kailua, but most of the land here belongs to the Castle Estate. Finally, the state of Hawaii owns nearly all of Waimanalo. In the past, those who owned the land generally were responsible for determining whether it would be developed or left alone. Many of the communities along Windward Oahu's coastline are situated on leasehold land, but they are becoming increasingly active in determining what kind of community they live in. I've tried to avoid high rises, try to avoid high density. We want a rural type community that we've been used to all our lives, uh, knowing our neighbors and, and our families. Um, to do this, we've been trying very hard to participate in any planning process. The city, the state, um, we formed our neighborhood board before many, many areas did, in hopes that we can participate in the planning for our future. Each estate or each large property owner is only concerned about maximum density and a profit or a return on their investment and their density. What we've got to do is to bring those six or seven together and plan it as one. I believe in the free enterprise and I believe in property ownership, but I also believe that um, profit has ruined too much of our land. High density has um, not been the best in some areas, and I think that all parties, the owners, the developers, the state, and the people working together and jointly can plan an intelligent community. Many people remember being able to move freely from the sea to the mountains before the large property owners required permits to cross their land. Kuhuku resident Tom Pickard. You can go to the oceans. You know, there was nothing, there was no fence line that would stop you from going down the sh to the sea. Uh, same with the mountains. Uh, you didn't have to get a or some type of writ to get a, to cross a piece of land. I, I'm just, I'd like to see, have my, my grandchildren, my sons, to see what I saw when I was younger. Uh, now they, they, there's no way they can see it. Whether on privately owned land or state property, if there are people on the land and plans to develop, the same thing usually happens, eviction. Evictions have been commonplace in Hawaii when a landowner wanted to remove leasehold residents in order to develop 
and the windward side is no exception. Communities are beginning to resist being evicted for developments which would endanger the rural quality of life on the windward side. The prime example of a leasehold community which successfully achieved self-determination is the farming community of Waiaholi and Waikani Valleys. State purchase of Waiaholi Valley ensured the agricultural land use which the land had been zoned for and ensured the continuance of the rural lifestyle in this part of Kahalu. Evictions of tenants by community landowners who want to develop will face close scrutiny as a result of Waiaholi and Waikani. Bobby Fernandez led the community in its effort to remain in the valley. Basically the same when people are being evicted, yeah, definitely everybody's being evicted, they're evicted the same way, but the specifics are different. Our like, government wants, should play key roles in every eviction issue where communities are being destroyed and it, things can be worked out, not necessarily have to be purchased. The message that we're getting, that any landowner is getting from people like that is if you have any poor people living on your land, you'd better ease them out of the land quietly now before the uh, uh, before it becomes an issue. Before the instigators get a hold of, of you, because what it when they do get a hold of you, you're in for all kinds of court costs and bad publicity. Three major eviction proceedings are expected to be carried out on Windward Oahu by the end of the year as a result of large landowners who have new plans for their land. Heiakea residents live on land sold 17 years ago to the Hawaiian Electric Company by Bishop Estate. HECO at one time intended to build a nuclear power plant here. Now those plans have been dropped, but the eviction proceedings continue. The Heiakea residents are contesting their evictions in court. Malai Kahana residents who live on beachfront property leased from Campbell Estate may receive eviction notices from the state by the end of the year. The State Parks Department has bought the first 70-acre increment of this property and will eventually own all 150 acres here. The homes will be demolished in order to make a public park. Campbell Estate sold some of its beachfront property near Kahuku to the developers of the Kuilima Hotel, but continued to lease the adjoining beach property of Cavella Bay to about 75 families who have homes here. Prudential Insurance Company owns the Kuilima and has recently bought the Cavella Bay property from Campbell Estate. Prudential wants to expand the resort facility and has reduced the homeowner's leases to a 90-day basis. Prudential may also require residents to obtain a bond which would guarantee that the residents comply peacefully with evictions when the time comes. Don Wasson is a Kuleana landowner in Laie. She says that the agrarian community there is changing because of the land leasehold system practiced by Zion Securities, the land acquisition branch of the Mormon Church. We have a lot of people that do want to have farms in Laie, but um, it's never made of available to, uh, to them by the Zion Securities because the leases that they're charging are so high. And more importantly is that the people um, are given short-term leases. So let's say you have a crop and they say, okay, we'll let you lease the land for one year. I mean, you know, how can you grow crop and make you know, ends meet with you know, such a short-term lease? And so this is happening. When Zion Security tells you to get off, you get off whether you know, your crop's still growing or not and you're given like so many days to get off. And my uncle who raised pigs, you know, in the back, was given 15 days notice to get off. You know, and so, you know, I'm, I'm sad because it's our way of life, of, you know, living off the land, I'm raising pigs in our own backyard, you know, planting and everything and living off the land and you know, no longer is it in existence. And I don't like that. I think they'll have to organize and be pretty much committed to a lot of work. Uh, if you have a number of people who are willing to do that and just continually be a pain in the neck for the developers and uh, government officials, it will delay things. And although delay may not look like a good weapon, it is. Uh, delay means money to the developers. I like this movement of people organizing to uh, have an impact on 
government decisions. Really, what I, what I like is to see people understand that they have rights and that they can exercise it. The eviction of Malai Kahana residents to create a public park is an exception to the rule. Most evictions occur in order to develop resort or residential units. Population growth can't be denied, and most windward communities are prepared to accept their share of the growth under certain conditions. We're not really anti-development. Um, there are probably uh, a lot of vacant lots in the community that could still be utilized to, for more development, for people who want to move into the community and to, uh, to live this sort of a lifestyle. I don't think what we, one thing that we don't want is them going over here and uh, building uh, six or 7,000 housing units next to us, and that would just disrupt this lifestyle no end. It'd be just like moving into Honolulu. People need places to live, but uh, all the developments that are proposed for this area, except for one, uh, have housing that the people here can afford. And what some of us are really afraid of is that as these expensive uh, housing comes into the area, the uh, property value goes up, taxes go up, rents go up, and the people that have been living here all their lives may then not be able to afford to live here. And our basic policy on growth is we do not want to see unregulated or hit and miss growth occurring out here. We'd like to see growth if there's going to be any growth, and there's bound to be some, uh, come in uh, after we have it pretty well planned where that growth is going to be. Again, what we're trying to do is to prevent people from outside of the community from coming in and really uh, buying up acres and acres of land and, you know, spreading suburban type homes all over the whole valley. We felt that this way it gives us time to talk, it gives us time to plan, it gives us time as residents now of the valley and citizens here to get together and, and talk these things over before other people from outside are coming in and telling us what they're going to do. So they're, they're going to have to um, uh, accustom themselves to the idea that they cannot be the only fortunate, favored part of the island where there is to be nothing new happening. You can't just shut your eyes and say it must all go ever or let them redevelop um, the Waikiki jungle and let everybody move there. The people who live there now have kids. The kids went to Castle High School and they went to uh, Kailua High School and they're going to want to live on the windward side. And it's just not fair to say, okay, you kids, you move over to Eva. When they're windward kids, they're our kids. We have to provide a place for them to live. So the only thing to do is to, I think, to present to the community, here are the alternatives, here are the things that can reasonably be expected to be accomplished now. What do you want? Several communities have come up with answers to that question. Kahuku, Waimanalo, and this neighborhood in Kahalu have solved the problem of providing low-cost housing for their residents by forming housing corporations. All have received federal assistance in funding their building programs. I asked Tom Picard about the kind of housing he would like for Kahuku. I don't like to have someone uh, dictate uh, values to me. Tell me, uh, hey, this is the type of house you're going to live in, and uh, it's good for you, and that's it. Well, uh, I don't buy that. Uh, I don't like. I don't buy uh, or prearrange, organize uh, homes. I, I like the guy who have uh, some kind of imagination. He can create his own. If it's a grass shack, fine. You know, what's wrong with a grass shack? Go on to Polynesian Cultural Center. You see some beautiful grass shacks there. The housing corporation in Kahuku was created after the sugar plantation closed and the residents realized they would have to make their own housing arrangements with Campbell Estate. Waimanalo's housing corporation was formed under similar circumstances. Their village area was scheduled for redevelopment by the state of Hawaii. Village residents were given eviction notices, but they eventually won the right to stay where they were in new homes which would be designed in part by the corporation. The state had wanted them to move into a nearby townhouse subdivision called Banyan Tree. This would have meant changing their lifestyle considerably, according to Judy Spencer, head of the corporation. 
Well, actually, they wanted their lifestyle, and their lifestyle consisted of animals, chickens and horses and goats, you know, so they stayed back and fought. It's a feeling of freedom, so to speak, you know. You have your own yard, you can walk around in it and, you know, n not offend anybody. I guess living in a banyan tree like the townhouses, it's an apartment-style thing, you know. Your next door neighbor is just on the other side of your wall. The feeling of freedom which a single family residence provides also takes up more space than a townhouse or an apartment building. High rise and high density are hard for most windward people to accept. I don't like the high rises. Oh. Do you like to see oh, I don't like that. I, I, I wish someone could stop it. Uh, it's enough buildings we have here already. I don't go for that stuff. If he's going to build up more high rise, this, this, this island going to sun. We're just floating now. Well, the agricultural area has all been in homes now. There's hardly too much more rural things. I think they're just put, pushing agriculture out of the way and making homes. And I guess they have to have it. Suburbs, I guess, they have to have a place to live. But I liked it when it was more farms and all green. But I guess that's progress. The um, temptation is to say, uh, let's make everything low rise. Let's have single family residences for everyone. If we add the predicted densities in single family, low rise residential developments, we're going to have wall to wall houses and yards all, all the way from Waimanalo to the end of Kahalu. And I would like to see the new density added in, in high rises. I think it's the only way we can keep any green at all. A lot of the green space on Windward Oahu is farmland, but as residential expansion increases, so does the pressure on two of the resources most vital to agriculture, water and land. In Waimanalo, some owners of fee simple farm lots have been offered over $40,000 an acre for their land by speculators and developers on the assumption that the zoning can be modified from agriculture to residential. The neighboring leasehold farmers are concerned. They have every right to sell, but I hate to see the agricultural use be terminated into some other non-agricultural use, plus the fact that if it's going to be turned into a subdivisions, then that will affect our type of operation here. And it has happened in, in other areas where uh, agriculture was there first, and then residential areas slowly crept up, you know, surrounding the areas. So it, it is a, a constant uh, problem. I feel that Waimanalo, that will be the best answer for Waimanalo to, to make into an ag park. And then the, for those who claim that the land is bad, who wants to sell, let them sell. And uh, let them get a fair price. Uh, what they can do is have a bunch of appraisers come by and appraise the land for farming for farming now, not for development, but for farming, and, and let them get a fair price for farming. Uh, I feel that uh, because of the shortage of ag land in, uh, on this island here, that, that we, for us to just, uh, just, just indiscriminately just urbanize land here and there, I think it's wrong. Oahu produces over 30% of the state's farm produce on only 10% of the state's total farm lands. The prime agricultural lands are on Oahu. Because of this, the State Department of Agriculture has plans to open two agricultural parks on the windward side, a banana plantation and processing plant in Waimanalo, and a diversified ag park in Kahuku. I asked John Farias, Agriculture Department Chairman, what the benefits of an ag park are to the farmer. We can assist in the marketing of, uh, of products. Uh, we can assist in the cooperative venture uh, of farming enterprises. We can assist in water development and a, and a whole host of things that a guy in, or, a, or a farmer, in the normal sense, uh, they would have to lease land from a, a private uh, individual or the state uh, or, or purchase land, uh, would have to do on his own. Junior Primacio, head of the Kahuku Housing Corporation, gives an example. Present uh, farmers now, they are responsible for the drain ditches that flows to the ocean. Now, these farmers, besides having their problem trying to produce food for the state of Hawaii and make a few bucks for them, have to take care about a ditch 
you know, that eventually would flow into the ocean, which becomes a state problem. I think if the state park becomes a reality, the state would have to maintain the ditch and let the farmers farm where they're supposed to be doing their thing. Our reason here is really to provide the people with a choice of activities. Um, and it's up to them. They can pick and choose. But without the agricultural land, there aren't going to be any choices. Uh, and it'd be pretty tough to have all this property turned into um, high-rise hotels or industrial property. The agricultural parks should solve the problem of providing land for the farmers, but there's still a problem with water. It's expensive and it's in very short supply. Many of the taro farmers and other farmers here in Kahalu rely on stream water to irrigate their crops. Lately, the Board of Water Supply has been diverting six or seven million gallons of water a day through a tunnel and a series of wells up at Waihei Falls. The taro farmers here have filed suit against the Board of Water Supply, saying that the six or seven million gallons a day they've been taking out of the stream doesn't leave them enough for their taro production. They say they need at least three million gallons a day in order to have a good taro crop. Recently, the farmer's case was heard in court, and the judge decided that they should get 2.6 million gallons of water a day. The farmers consider this a partial victory and hope that it will be enough for their continued taro production. To a group which the Board of Water Supply once described as extremely sensitive to their water rights, the effect of the low stream flow for the past six months was enough to keep the farmers in court, insisting on a return of their stream water. I don't think that, uh, I just hope that agriculture can, can, can continue and expand. I think it's absolutely essential that it does on, in these islands. I don't think we can continue to rely on the mainland for our su uh, supply of food. Well, we have to feed our own first. And uh, if we continue on allowing outside people or big companies to uh, handle all the uh, food distribution in Hawaii, I think uh, we'll be at the mercy of these few individual people or organizations, companies, or whatever. Um, I see that farming is a viable future. I think we're in competition with agriculture at the present time. There's no question about it. And I think uh, the, uh, whoever are the policymakers will have to decide whether uh, we're going to have increased population or whether we're going to retain agriculture. So I think at some point in time, agriculture will probably have to give if population increases are going to be accommodated. But so long as we have that type of uh thinking or attitude prevailing that whenever there's a competing use between urban water and agriculture water that agriculture will lose uh, so long as we have that type of attitude prevailing I think we're in trouble that agriculture water is also in great demand and it ought to be preserved and if we are to urbanize certain areas and develop water for them then let the urban areas pay for the water development uh, that is needed for that area and not undermine the agriculture water effort I think the water problem is not only here. It's also connected with the whole island. The whole stream is low. Uh, people are taking too much water, flushing them down toilets. I mean, they're taking them down Hawaii Kai and all over the island. Hawaii has a limited amount of resources, water, land, everything. It's very, very limited, very obviously finite. And we have to try to use it to the best advantage of, of the most people. Our limited resources, land and water, also happen to be the things which attract people to the windward side. The beaches and open space attract tourists and new residents who want to enjoy what the windward side has to offer. The majority of windward residents work on the other side of the mountains. It's taking them longer and longer to get to work in the mornings and to come home in the afternoons. Whether to build Another highway has been a source of controversy for years, resulting in part of this TH3 being completed and open, even though the remainder of the highway has been stopped by a court ruling. E. Alvey Wright, State Director of Transportation, staunchly supports a third highway. The city's general plan that was adopted in January of 1977 essentially confirms the predicted population growth of Windward Oahu. And secondly, that same general plan also indicates a second urban center. 
that would be around Aia and Pearl Harbor and extending on out uh, perhaps to Barbers Point where we do contemplate a new harbor there. If this is the case, jobs will be located in that area, whereas my neighbors who work there will be uh, residing in Winwood, Oahu, so that they will very much need that cross-town movement. And the same thing we predict for Winwood, Oahu. It will grow whether or not there's an H3. But to be sure, the better the public services of whatever kind, the more rapid the growth may be. So TH3 might accelerate the growth. Would you be in favor of the TH3 being built? Uh, no. Why not? Well, then they would have more problems, huh? I've noticed that uh, the Licky Licky Highway has been, um, we have a lot of cars going through. We need a TH3. Apparently, uh, there's some movement not to develop the rest of the windward side. And I think that would be great. And therefore, we wouldn't need the H3. I know what it's like to go across the Polly and the Wilson daily with that bumper to bumper. And I think the H3 would just be an advantage to all of us on the windward side. I think the TH3 would help this community out, these people on this side. To me, to me, it would help a lot. Do you think it would bring uh, more people over here, more development? Well, it would, but yet the people on this side should take into consideration it'd be a help to them to get on the other side and not vice versa. I supported H3 from the very beginning and I'm all for it. And until the time that the city and county, as well as the state, can guarantee me, my neighbors, and everybody else on the windward side, that there will be no more construction anywhere from Waimanalo to Kahuko, no more rezoning, no more apartments, no more commercial buildings, then I will say, Vicky, we do not need H3. But they cannot guarantee me this. Well, as a mere fact, you put a highway on there doesn't mean you immediately have to put in high density. And uh, especially in this case, where the highway was, was to take care of existing needs, not future needs. After, if we develop this into a metropolitan type area, you're gonna have to have something else besides TH3. You'll probably have to have TH4 or five or something. If TH3 is allowed to be built, we will not have that family, community life that we enjoy. Certainly there will be a lot more development. It would be doubtful if the Waikani area would be left in agricultural lands. Uh, the possibility of development is there. I think we'd open up Pandora's box for a lot more development and perhaps a second Waikiki along our coastline, even with our um, coastal zone um, laws that we now have. Uh, we are afraid that what H3 would do uh, is to disturb the lifestyle of uh, the residents of Kahalu, Kaneohe, and down the whole coast. Uh, it's the same, the same story as any place else. As long as, as long as you bring a highway through, urbanization will come in. To urbanization, uh, a house uh, or a, a landowner, the taxation will go up. So, uh, give me a live example. In Kahalu, uh, on Wahei Road, when they built Wahei Road, to nowhere, okay, you travel that road and it goes nowhere. Now, everybody was assessed. Every homeowner was assessed. Uh, we had to pay assessment of uh, $20,000 just for putting a highway inside. But as you drive up that road, where the hell that road goes to? Yeah, nowhere. <laughs> this is Wahei Road, the road to nowhere widened at property owner's expense in order to provide access to a resort development planned for the back of the valley, a resort which never materialized. Wahei Road is an example of the kind of improvement most Winwood residents say they don't want, don't need, and can't afford. As a result of developments like this, which haven't really improved the quality of life on the Winwood side, many residents here have developed a sharper awareness of what they do want. We really want to be very careful to maintain our open space and, and that kind of a rural identity. Even I know that reports show that we're growing, which, you know, I can understand that, but I don't think that we've grown to the point where we can't kind of reverse the trend and, and slow down and uh, keep some of what we have, which is kind of an old Hawaii flavor.